Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to my planetarium show for April of 2021. This show is put together using a software called Stellarium, which you can download for free. And what I'm going to show you is the sky at night as it would be on the 17th of April in the middle of the month. So we're just going to let the uh, sun begin to set down towards the west here in the sky. You can already see another object right up in the uh, top corner there. And here we go, the sun's setting down towards the west. We're letting time run forward at much greater than normal speed. And as it goes down towards the horizon, we get the traditional colours of sunset over the landscape. And we'll bring things to a halt just as the sun disappears. So that we've got the twilight sky. And we'll go and see the first couple of objects that have become visible. So first of all, We've got the crescent moon, a very thin crescent here. And as shown in this image, under these conditions, you often can see the unlit, the unsunlit side of the moon reflecting back what's called earth light, where the uh, earth is uh, bouncing light onto the moon and back again. So well worth going and having a look. And also hiding in the twilight, our last chance really to see it uh, for quite a while to come actually, another two years before we get another good view, is the planet Mars. Um, so if you haven't seen it, now's the time to go and have a look. You'll need a telescope to see it well because it is quite small. And we see the disk here and two of its moons, Phobos and Deimos, fear and panic. Now if we look in detail at the surface of Mars, we can see the large volcanoes on the surface, three in a row towards the bottom and one much larger one. The large one is Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. So we'll pull back away from Mars and uh, let time run on forward a little bit so that we've got a properly dark sky and all the rest of the stars have now come out. And Mars and the Moon are in the constellations of Taurus at the moment. But we're not going to investigate Taurus. We've done that in an earlier show earlier in the year when it was better placed. What we're going to do is run the clock forward to uh, 9.15 so that we've got a proper dark sky. You'll see one or two satellites zipping around. Uh, there's an awful lot of space junk up there these days. And uh, the Stellarium software knows about it all and knows where to plot it. So you can use it to find things like when the International Space Station is going to be visible. So now that the sky is properly dark at quarter past nine, let's have a look at the first constellation of our tour. And that's the constellation of Gemini the Twins. Here's the stick figures showing clearly the, uh, the two men stood side by side holding hands there. And there's the artwork. You can just see the tips of the horns of the bull Taurus with Mars just between them. But uh, just next to Mars at the foot of Gemini, we've got some very interesting objects. Um, we're just going to show you this one, which is an exploded star, a supernova remnant, where a, a giant star blew up some time ago and has left this cloud of expanding gas, which will gradually dissipate into the interstellar medium. We're not exactly sure when it happened. It's at least 3,000 years ago, but uh, hard to tell. So it might be 30,000. That's the jellyfish nebula in the foot of Gemini. There are several other images, uh, several other objects that we could find and take images of with our telescopes and cameras in the constellation of Gemini, but I haven't got time to go into them all this evening. What we're going to do is swing over to the west a little bit and run time forward to midnight because I want to show you that it's galaxy season and particularly I want to show you a couple of constellations that are absolutely stuffed full of uh, interesting galaxies that you can go and find. So we'll bring the uh, time forward to midnight. You see the sky rotating there as the earth turns underneath it. And the first constellation is this one, Leo the Lion. It almost looks like a lion. 
It's one of the ones, there's the stick diagram, which actually the outline does seem to suggest an animal as it's supposed to be. And there's the lion in all its glory with the long tail at the back. I think you can still see those stars do outline it very well. But as I say, there are several groups of galaxies. So we'll start with this one here based around M95. This is a, a spiral galaxy and it's part of a group. So we've got M95 there, about 37 million light years away from us. And you can see the other galaxies. Here's M96. We're going a bit closer for this one. You can see the spiral structure of it um, around the bright nucleus there. And uh, that's the sort of view you'll get through a small telescope. And then we'll go out along and look at the third main member of this group, Messier object number 105, which is the brightest of these three galaxies that we see together. And M105 is an elliptical galaxy, quite a large one. And it has these two other companion galaxies that it's likely to merge with at some point in the future. And so we'll see those in many billions of years as an even larger single galaxy. And I imagine that all of the ones we've just seen are going to form together into a single galaxy eventually. Now here towards the tail of the lion, we've got the Leo triplet, the famous one that uh, is Messier 66, 65 and an object that Charles Messier missed, NGC 3628, which is the one at the top there. We'll zoom in on that because we're looking at this one edge on and I think it shows a very interesting aspect with the dust lane carving across the middle. It looks a little bit like a sort of a sandwich or a hamburger. Um, you've got the bright nucleus obscured by all of that dust and uh, dirty material in the plane of the galaxy. So it looks uh, quite strange. But uh, the other two look very much more like classic spirals. Now we can go over to a different shape galaxy, a barred spiral, NGC 2903, the Catherine wheel. And this one very much shows the red colour in the centre of old stars, red and orange stars, and the blue stars in the spiral arms, picking out where new star formation has been happening recently. Um, and that's quite a bright galaxy. I'm again surprised that Charles Messier missed that one. So that's uh, all in the constellation of Leo. Just at the moment, though, we've got a wanderer passing through, and that is the brightest of the asteroids, asteroid Vesta. And this is not the largest of the asteroids. That would be asteroid series number one. Uh, so Vesta is about half that size, about 500 kilometers across. Series is 950. But uh, nevertheless, it, it comes closer to the Earth, and so we see it more brightly. And a small round object, almost large enough to be classified as a dwarf planet. But um, and I think it should have been. But uh, it does have a very large crater on one side and is quite elliptical. So a bit of a debate about that one as to whether that should or shouldn't count as a dwarf planet. It looks round enough to me. So that's Vesta. Now you won't see that as a, uh, anything other than a tiny point of light, even with a powerful telescope, but you will see it move. So now if we swing next door to the constellation of Virgo, and we uh, pick the outline out first there, showing the, the stick diagram. You see that bowl shape at the top, and there's uh, Virgo herself overlaid on it. So uh, the bowl shape is made up of her torso and the head region. And what we'll do is look inside here because there are absolutely loads of galaxies. You can see some of them here. Um, there's a whole host of different galaxies, spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies, uh, lenticular galaxies, all mixed together. This is all part of the huge Virgo cluster, which is about 50 million light years away. Um, and contains so much mass that it's pulling everything, including the Milky Way galaxy, in towards it. So we will eventually be merged with the, the galaxies of the Virgo cluster. So now we're going to let time run on. It's about midnight uh, at the moment in uh, 
British summertime. We're going to head on to the very early morning, just before dawn, and see what objects we've got in the dawn sky. So I'll let time run and the sky will spin round. And then we'll swing over to the east once we get to the, uh, the right time. Coming up on midnight now. Here comes a, uh, the, uh, the ground coming up from the bottom. That's not a collection of UFOs. That's just a simulation of house lights on the ground. But we're going to change our aspect, pull back a little bit, and then swing over to the east. There's the Milky Way running down to the horizon, and we're looking at the constellation of Sagittarius, the archer. With the stick diagram, I tend to see more of a teapot than an archer, uh, but I think uh, the artwork shows how that's supposed to be joined up. So we'll take the artwork away and we'll zoom in on some of the star clouds of Sagittarius. This is looking towards the heart of the Milky Way galaxy and there's absolutely loads of different uh, star forming regions. This is the Eagle Nebula with the very famous pillars of creation that were photographed so spectacularly by the Hubble Space Telescope right in the center there. So it's uh, interesting to go and look for those. Just below it, we have the Swan Nebula. Uh, the very bright part is supposed to be the swan's wing with its head and neck and beak being rather faint over to the left hand side there. I think you can see the neck kind of swinging up around and then uh, the head's almost invisible, but uh, below it again, the Lagoon Nebula. Here a young star cluster has been formed and is blowing a bubble out of its cocoon of gas that it was formed in. I think you can see how all those bright stars are blowing away a huge cavity in the gas cloud that uh, they formed from there. And the pink colour is the colour from hydrogen gas. We can see that again here in the Triffid Nebula with the dark dust lanes cutting across it. But we can also see some blue coloured gas and that is reflecting light from very hot blue young stars that again have been born in this star forming region. So we'll pull back a bit. There's the Lagoon Nebula again and uh, the star clouds of Sagittarius are very rich hunting ground to go exploring for objects. Never very high above the horizon for us in the UK. So this is about the first chance to see it during the year. It uh, turns up at a more civilized time later in the year. Now over here, we've got a planet, the planet Jupiter and some of its moons. And you can see this in the dawn sky at the moment. Um, it will get better during the year as it gets uh, higher in earlier times of the night. So we'll get it uh, coming to opposition in about August, I think. And here we would see the uh, very high resolution view with the cloud belts and all the storm systems on the surface. They're absolutely spectacular. And this is the sort of photograph I can take with my 14 inch reflector telescope in my own observatory of that sort of quality. Now we'll just pull back and show you the, the positions of some of the moons, the four large ones discovered by Galileo orbit around Jupiter and the closest in is this one, Io, which is about the size of the Earth's moon. But if we zoom right in at a Voyager spacecraft image here, it's absolutely covered in yellow and uh, other forms of sulfur even the black and the red is sulfur. And that's because it's the most volcanic world in the solar system, constantly erupting and uh, bursting forth material on resurfacing itself. And I thought I'd just show you this time a couple of Jupiter's smaller moons, which you do need quite a powerful telescope to track down. This is Amalthea, the fifth largest and fifth brightest of Jupiter's moons. Orbits closer in to Jupiter than Io, uh, in a little group of moons, that's Amalthea. And just over here, we've got Ad Astria, another one, slightly smaller again. But there are a group of them that orbit interior to Io, 
and so they don't take very long at all to whiz around but they are really tiny and uh, you may just pick them up with a powerful telescope as a point of light i think at our public observing evenings at the institute of astronomy in cambridge we have uh, tracked down a couple of them on occasions going back to the larger galilean moons this is europa again about the size of our moon same size as Io, but covered in ice. And that ice is cracked. You can see the cracks and grooves running across the surface there. And beneath that ice, we think there is a habitable, warm, salty ocean kept warm by gravitational forces in a tug of war. The same heat source that keeps Io erupting all those volcanoes. The third moon out is Ganymede, and this is the largest moon in the solar system bigger even than the planet Mercury, covered in interesting glacial formations on the surface and some craters, so a mixed terrain. But again, it looks like a geologically active world. And we also think that there is a briny ocean underneath that crust, which again might be a habitable or even inhabited zone in the solar system. The fourth of the Galilean moons, just slightly smaller than Ganymede is Callisto. And this is not geologically active. It's not taking part in the tug of war that uh, the other three moons undergo with Jupiter. It's minding its own business further away um, and has a very old and inactive geologically uh, surface covered in impact craters. So we'll pull back away from Jupiter now and sling ourselves slightly over to the right on the screen and another bright object, which will be the planet Saturn just here, very close to Jupiter in the sky at the moment. You can zoom right in and get the view that you would get with a small telescope with the planet and its rings and one or two of the moons. You can almost always see the bright moon Titan over to the left there. And it's a challenge to try and count off how many other moons of Saturn you can track down. But if we zoom right in for the powerful telescope view, this is the sort of image that I can get with my telescope. I can pick up uh, five, six, seven, eight of Saturn's moons. I can see the uh, gaps between the different rings there, the dark Cassini division and the further out towards the edge there, the Enki division. Now, if we have a look at Titan, Titan always looks like a sort of orangey color. And that is because what we're looking at is the orange smog of organic materials in this atmosphere of Titan, which is about 150% as dense as our own. So it's really got quite a substantial atmosphere. Again, a planet sized moon about the same size as the planet Mercury. Um, all sorts of interesting uh, weather and rain and uh, things made of methane and uh, liquid natural gas on the surface there. But I'm afraid our time is up now and the sun will be up very, very shortly and the stars will fade away as the dawn comes up. So we'll have to bring the show to an end there. I hope you've enjoyed that and I'll see you for the next one.